Uh, I am Jeremy Goldcorn, an editor and journalist who lived in China for 20 years and now working as an editorial fellow for Chinafile.com, which is a website of the Asia Society. I'm introducing myself because Dr. Leonie Henschke, the executive director of the Tennessee World Affairs Council, had the misfortune to be in a building where there was a surprise fire drill. Um, so uh, forgive me for introducing myself. The Tennessee World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization that promotes global literacy, international awareness, understanding, and connections to prepare Tennesseans to thrive in an increasingly complex and connected world. Um, today, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. James, uh, to welcome James Stevens, a fellow of the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. Um, and I am going to be moderating a discussion uh, with him. So thank you very much to Dr. Leonie Henschke and to the Tennessee World Affairs Council for hosting us. Hello to our audience. Thank you for being here. As uh, we will take questions via Zoom uh, chat function. So feel free to write in your questions at any time, but we'll get to them towards the end of today's webinar. Our guest today, as I mentioned, is James A. Stevens, a fellow with Stimson Center's Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program, where he leads the Defense Strategy and Planning Project. He is the editor of the 2023 book, China's Use of Armed Coercion to Win Without Fighting, which is what we're going to talk about today. He knows a lot about the subject. He is also co-editor of Military Coercion and U.S. Foreign Policy, the Use of Force, Short War published in 2020, among many other roles connected to our understanding of grand strategy, military coercion, terrorism, and gray zone conflict. Prior to joining Stimson, he was a data analyst at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terror Terrorism at the University of Maryland, where he contributed to a Department of Defense-sponsored study on gray zone conflict. He's done a bunch of other things too, but these aspects of his biography highlight why he's the perfect person to help us understand what China is doing in much of its neighborhood. Welcome, James, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Leanne, for in inviting me to, to be with you today. So let's get straight into it. Um, can you explain the, the concept of coercion as used in your field for a, a layman audience and how you got interested in studying it? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I'm actually, I'll give you the long version of uh, the answer to that question, uh, just to kind of help uh, situate this work in its proper context. So uh, my work is focused on the role of military force in international politics, uh, and especially in great power competition. Uh, now, I'm particularly interested in understanding the utility of armed force and its function uh, in supporting or advancing different foreign policy uh, goals short of armed conflict, right? short of engaging in a contest of arms. So over the past six years uh, or so, my work has largely focused on explaining how, why, and to what effect the United States and now China uh, have used their armed forces to pursue their international political uh, and diplomatic objectives without waging war. Uh, in other words, how our governments have used uh, threats and demonstrations of force, like military exercises or demonstrations of different capabilities, uh, as well as kind of calibrated uses of violence, what's what's uh, uh, called kinetic force sometimes, um, combined with other tools of statecraft, like economic sanctions or diplomatic uh, negotiations, in order to try to persuade or dissuade other governments uh, over particular issues, right? Essentially to try to get other states to comply with certain demands or policy preferences. So uh, in brief, what we see in international politics is that states and especially great powers try to use their armed forces to achieve goals and defend their interests through intimidation essentially rather than uh, engaging in contests of violence if that kind of contest is avoidable. So during, during these last few years, as you mentioned, I've produced two edited volumes dealing with the subject. One focused on how the US has used its armed forces since the end of the Cold War uh, for purposes of getting its way in different disputes. 
Uh, that book was entitled Military Coercion and U.S. Foreign Policy, The Use of Force Short of War, which was co-edited with Melanie Sisson and Barry Blackman. And then most recently, as you mentioned, China's use of armed coercion to win without fighting. Now, uh, going back to the basic concepts in play here, these projects both kind of trace back in important ways to the work of Thomas Schelling, uh, whose book entitled Arms and Influence pioneered the theory of coercive bargaining in international security. So he talked about various approaches to military signaling uh, and posturing, uh, engaging in brinksmanship as a way of kind of communicating between states what issues they, they were uh, serious about, essentially. So for Schelling, coercion comes in kind of two basic flavors, deterrence and compellence. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, in brief, deterrence is an effort to dissuade another country from engaging in a, in a particular course of action. Compellence is an effort to convince them to engage in a particular course of action. Uh, now, for purposes of the study and in Schelling's work, uh, there is a kind of area of overlap where it becomes difficult to sort of make a clean distinction between deterrence and compellence. And I won't uh, drag us into a philosophical debate uh, or, or a uh, uh, sort of semantic debate about it, but just to say that we found it useful to look at instances where there was a deterrent demand and that deterrent demand was violated and there was an effort to what we call roll back the uh, violator to desist from a violation of, of a deterrence demand. Okay, so sorry for the, the compl uh, complexity there, but these are, these are concepts that, one, you know, one of the goals is to help foster greater conceptual clarity when we hear the Department of Defense talk about deterrence it's important to understand what exactly uh, the United States is attempting to deter, right? And then how it imagines the actions that it's undertaking and the operations and the changes in force posture perhaps contribute to deterring the, the issues or the actions, courses of action that uh, we, we wanna prevent. So when I say coercion short of war, I mean deterrence or compellence principally. Right? Efforts to use our armed forces to prevent other states from doing things we don't want them to do or persuade them to take actions that we want them to take without simply attempting to impose an outcome directly by force of arms um, or to engage in a sustained conflict of, of violence over uh, the issue. So it's an effort to resolve challenges to national interests using uh, what's called demonstrative military force independently or with these other tools of statecraft to convince another country to comply with a set of demands or policy preferences. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for setting it up that way, because I'm already starting to imagine, you know, how this applies to China. So let's talk about China. What, what are the different types of armed coercion that China uses? I mean, on the Indian border, they seem to be building roads and engaging in actual combat, but with Indian troops, but using no firearms, just wooden sticks as weapons. But obviously, they're doing very different things with Taiwan and the Philippines and Japan. Yes. So it's it's a very good point. And that's, uh, I think it helps highlight the fact that, you know, what a country is attempting to deter or what a country is attempting to compel another country to do matters a great deal. It's not sufficient to simply say that we're trying to deter China. Deter China from what? Right? Uh, there are a variety of courses of action that China could undertake that the United States would feel uh, compelled to respond to, uh, but its response would be different, and it might not even need to respond in some instances, depending on what the nature of the challenge is, right? So as you noted, you know, in, in India, uh, China has a long-standing disagreement with the Indian government over the status of several areas of their border. Uh, essentially, the, the Indian border was established by the British, uh, the McMahon line, uh, during the colonial period, and India is satisfied with that border. Essentially, it says there is not a contested border. We have the border. That's where it is. And the Chinese perspective is that they never agreed to 
that border. And so they essentially insisting upon negotiations over who's uh, who's rightfully in control of different areas of, of the border. Um, now, we can talk more about that, but I think it's uh, important also to recognize that even in other geographies like the South China Sea, where much of the contestation that we see is over issues like oil and gas exploration or fishing rights, um, or just navigational rights for that matter. Uh, but in those instances, China's efforts are usually related to some underlying territorial dispute with its neighbors, a disagreement over who has legitimate uh, legal jurisdiction and sovereignty over different geographies. And uh, so even though, like I said, the the specific way that the that the uh, friction might appear to us, right, chasing away fishermen, for, for instance, that's really related to an underlying territorial dispute. Uh, and that's the, the example, aside from Taiwan, the example that's generally raised when you uh, hear about China's use of gray zone coercion is its behavior in the South China Sea, right? So since uh, at least 2007, China has used maritime law enforcement uh, vessels and later Coast Guard vessels to conduct hundreds of so-called special operations that were aimed at expelling foreign fishermen from areas that China asserts are within its maritime jurisdiction. Um, now that means shooing uh, Vietnamese fishermen away from the Paracel Islands, for example, um, or conducting uh, what they call rights protection cruises around areas like James Shoal that are far from the Chinese coastline, but are within what uh, China and, uh, you know, the, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China before it declared as kind of uh, areas of Chinese control, um, whether it has to do with traditional fishing rights or it has to do with maritime areas under Chinese jurisdiction, or it has to do with declared sovereign territory. Now, not to uh, complicate the issue too much, but uh, one of the challenges here is that many of these geographies uh, in the maritime space are not actually considered territory in an international legal sense. They don't fit the criteria for uh, island territories. And so that's another fundamental challenge that China's presenting. When you hear uh, this issue talked about uh, in the States, at least, it's, it's usually asserted that China is challenging the rules-based international order. What is really meant by that depends on who you're speaking to, but one of the facets uh, of China's challenge to a rules-based order is a challenge to just international legal definitions of territory over which China can claim sovereignty and can claim to have an exclusive economic zone that it has under its jurisdiction, right? So China's basically making an excessive claim about its rights in some of these geographies, in addition to claiming that they're mine, not Malaysia's, or they're mine, not Vietnam's, or they're mine, not the Philippines, et cetera. So it has disputes with its neighbors over who has a right to these uh, economic resources and also to exercise legal jurisdiction in the areas. And, and it also has a dispute with kind of international legal definitions of territory uh, in, in some instances. Um, I, I, could we talk a little bit about Taiwan? Because I, I, I get the sense that, you know, much of most of China's armed coercion is aimed at, at securing certain geographies, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, and you've explained the complexities of that. But Taiwan is a little bit different because it's not just the, the, the island that they want. There's, there are other things. Well, so I think the um, hmm, Taiwan is very different, I think, in, in some important ways. So uh, Taiwan is not, um, you know, a low tide elevation, right? It's an island. Uh, it can sustain a population. It is territory. Uh, China insists that Taiwan is part of its territory and that it has sovereignty over 
the island of Taiwan and its other outlying territories. Right? There, there are other islands that Taiwan has effective control over, administers, um, but are still claimed by the People's Republic of China. Now, um, I, I already mentioned that the Republic of China on Taiwan has the same territorial claims, formally speaking, that the PRC has with regard to these, these uh, South China Sea disputes. So there's actually quite a bit of overlap in terms of what how both sides of the Taiwan Strait kind of uh, think about the geographic scope of China. Um, the original dispute is essentially which is the rightful government of China. And in 1971, uh, the Republic of China was replaced in the UN by the People's Republic of China. This is what the People's Republic of China uh, insists is the moment at which international consensus agreed with it on the status of Taiwan as part of China that recognized the PRC as the sole legal government of China. Um, obviously, the ROC, Republic of China, does not agree with that. And it, ha it to this day, has uh, diplomatic relations with, with several countries. Um, it, it considers itself essentially a, a self-governing, autonomous legal entity, right, or territorial entity. But it has not formally, constitutionally declared itself to be separate from China. It still formally claims to be China. And so there's a, a fundamental goal for the PRC is to deter the government on Taiwan from making changes to its constitution that would formally separate it from China. So its primary goal is kind of a negative deterrence goal. Don't declare independence formally, right? And as long as Taiwan refrains from doing that, China essentially um, is satisfied that that specific red line has not been violated, right? Um, but it's also seeking formal unification with Taiwan. It wants Taiwan essentially to submit to some form of uh, consolidated statehood with the PRC. Um, there were various formulations that have that have come up, like one country, two systems, for example, but uh, those have become more remote possibilities in, in the view of many kind of Taiwan watchers. Um, especially following the experience of Hong Kong where it lost sovereignty or it lost autonomy and self-rule. Uh, Hong Kong had been democratically sort of self-governed within uh, the People's Republic. And that the when the People's Republic essentially asserted legal direct uh, control in Hong Kong, it played out before the, the world audience what it looks like when, when the one country, two systems approach is implemented in, in practice. And so um, I would argue and others have argued that that example has not uh, encouraged folks on Taiwan to, to pursue a similar course. Um, not, I, I hesitate to, to say too much on Taiwan because it is a very sensitive issue uh, for the PRC and for US PRC relations. I think if there is a single issue that uh, could lead to a direct conflict between the United States and China, it would be Taiwan. And in fact, the uh, continued autonomy that Taiwan enjoys is really only due or is largely due to the United States military uh, actions in 1950, where the United States essentially prevented the Chinese Civil War from continuing by sending the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait. And uh, there have been exchanges of fire between the two sides since then, 
the United States has made cross strait uh, peace, stability, and maintenance of the status quo a cornerstone of its policy towards China. And China has made insistence upon a one China policy in the United States a cornerstone of its relations with the United States. And in fact, when the United States and the PRC established uh, normal diplomatic relations, the documents that kind of undergirded that normalization of relations make very explicit that China regards Taiwan as the central kind of prerequisite issue to normal relations between the US and China. So when we hear talk about, uh, you know, is the one China policy still serving US interests? Or is this something that we should reconsider? I think it's important to bear in mind that that is implicitly asking does the United States want to continue to have normal relations with the PRC, or is it willing to gamble on severing those relations or severely undermining those relations? Right. That makes sense. Um, so, I mean, I think you've just said that Taiwan is probably the most dangerous flashpoint in terms of armed coercion failing, essentially, and turning into armed mm -hmm. conflict. Uh, what are the other flashpoints that you think are dangerous in terms of uh, China's neighbors or with the United States? Yeah, I, I mean, there have definitely been um, some uh, violent encounters between uh, Chinese Coast Guard and Philippines Coast Guard um, recently around Second Thomas Shoal and around Sabina Shoal. And uh, so I would say the Philippines is probably the, the number two potential flashpoint uh, for, for uh, kind of a trigger of escalation um, because the United States has a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. And so if Chinese forces and Philippines forces were to uh, exchange fire, the Philippines would be well within its rights to call upon the United States to, to help it defend itself. Um, if China were to attempt to uh, forcibly dislodge uh, the, the Philippines Coast Guard or, or Navy from protecting areas within its territorial waters, or even from protecting uh, its own forces and, and civilians who are exercising their legal rights within the Philippines exclusive economic zone, those would be um, acute triggers for for escalation between China and the United States. Um, now, obviously, India and China have an ongoing border dispute. It has become more militarized, not less militarized in recent years. And China has essentially taken uh, effective control of territory that it did not have before. Um, the potential for that conflict to kind of reignite, to become hot again, is always uh, something worth keeping in the back of our, our minds. Um, but I think on a day-to-day -day basis, the friction with Taiwan and the friction with the Philippines are, are um, more likely to trigger some kind of a, an escalation or, or direct clash. Right, that makes sense. Um, so how much should the United States be threatened by China's use of um, coercion? And, and what mm -hmm. is the U.S. response to it that you think would be most effective in terms of American strategic goals? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, um, you know, very much my motivation for undertaking this study was to uh, get a better understanding myself uh, as to what exactly China has been doing that threatens or could threaten U.S. national interests, um, and you know it's it's something that is casually asserted these days that China is a growing menace, is a growing threat, but to whom and in what ways is is less uh, often articulated. And so, part of what I wanted to do with this book was to you know look at the historical record, both looking at when China has decided to go to war in the past, and also looking at what 
are the issues over which China has been willing to employ its armed forces uh, and paramilitary forces in these coercive ways, right? So that we could kind of map out the areas of most uh, likely uh, fr friction that could lead to escalation. And I think that the United States needs to be acutely worried about the, the two areas that I mentioned, Taiwan and the Philippines, because of the political commitments that it has undertaken of its own volition uh, with respect to those, those parties, right? So uh, the Philippines is a treaty ally. The United States doesn't even recognize Taiwan as an uh, independent sovereign country and has, as a matter of policy, uh, reiterated that it does not support Taiwan's independence. The reason for that is because it is all too clear to those who are paying attention that that is a red line that China would respond to in some way. So if the United States were to unilaterally declare that it recognizes Taiwan or the Republic of China as a sovereign member of the community of states, uh, that would trigger some kind of a harsh reaction from China, probably in excess of what we have seen before um, in terms of its threatening behavior. So one of the things that we should be aware of is that China uses armed coercion opportunistically and in a deliberate effort to kind of teach others a lesson about what not to do or what, what China finds unacceptable, et cetera, right? So it's a it's attempting to establish a kind of record of reliability and, and a degree of predictability about what will generate uh, threatening behavior up to and uh, possibly to include direct uh, military action. So it tries to it tries to balance its kind of uh, reactive um, or active defense is really the term that it uses uh, around these claims with its desire to also kind of maintain productive relations with its neighbors, right? So uh, it's simultaneously concerned about establishing a reputation as a responsible great power and also establishing a reputation as a country that's willing to use force to defend its interests. And that's the kind of balance balancing act that China's engaged in. So because China's behavior is uh, related to known issues, that makes it somewhat predictable. And therefore, the United States has both an advantage as a defender of the status quo to sort of know these are the issues over which China is going to get pushy. We don't have to guess where uh, or why. Um, but at the same time, uh, the U.S. needs to treat sensitive issues with sensitivity. In other words, to not deliberately undertake actions that will predictably bring about escalation, unless the United States is seeking escalation. But assuming that uh, you know the US goal is deterrence to prevent China from taking aggressive action, that's a kind of a negative goal. And the US basically can reassure China that it doesn't need to take aggressive action by refraining from taking actions itself that it knows would trigger uh, a Chinese response. Which is why there's all the dancing around the way we talk about Taiwan and, you know, when uh, President Biden uh, has, you know, what may be gaps, uh, but uh, um, it, it upsets the Chinese very much. That, that's right. Refers to, you know, suggests that uh, Taiwan, you know, is independent or that the U.S. would defend it. That, that, that's right. And, you know, uh, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration following it uh, did take steps to sort of change the United States approach toward Taiwan to deepen uh, kind of interactions between the government on Taiwan and the government in, in Washington. And so China has responded to those things by saber rattling and also placing kind of diplomatic pressure on the United States 
cutting off military to military communications at, at various points um, as a means of punishing DC for, for these policy changes. You know, the United States now places uh, more trainers on Taiwan than it had before. That's something that the Trump administration declassified in the in the last uh, weeks of its uh, administration. Um, the th That number has gone up under Biden. That is something that the United States uh, arguably agreed not to do uh, as part of the Shanghai communique. And yet China has essentially warned against it condemned it, but not responded uh, excessively, let's say. Um, but these are the things that that it is acutely concerned about, right? So increased arms sales to Taiwan, increased U.S. force presence on the island, increased engagement uh, directly between the uh, American and Taiwanese governments. Uh, these are all trappings of the one China policy as China wants the United States to practice it, that the United States has been willing to kind of shift in response to what it perceives as kind of a growing threat from China, right? So uh, I think China and the United States have kind of their fingers pointed at one another, obviously, right? But they have the causal uh, arrow pointed in opposite directions also. China says that it's threatening Taiwan to respond to provocative actions, pro-independence forces on the island, and uh, wrong signals that the United States is sending in support of uh, separatist forces in Taiwan. And the United States says it's trying to provide Taiwan with the means to defend itself and the kind of support that Taiwan needs to resist armed aggression by China because China is acting more threatening. So they're both looking at the same sets of issues but have different explanations and I think it's it's actually the case that both are are accurate. Both explanations are accurate. Makes sense. A reminder to the audience: we'll take questions via Zoom's chat function in uh, by text. Uh, feel free to write them anytime, and we'll get to them towards the end of today's webinar. Um, let's move on to you know uh, Washington D.C. Uh, the need to get tough on China is literally the only thing in U.S. politics right now where there is broad uh, bipartisan agreement. Um, but I, I worry that this also is leading us to groupthink, which can sometimes produce failing policies or policies that don't achieve the desired outcome. Uh, immersed as you are in the ways of uh, Washington, D.C. and inside the Beltway, what is your view on that? Uh I do think that there is a kind of uh, test competition about who can be tougher on China uh, in in DC these days, and uh, it it does. Uh, I, I think I agree with your concern about the potential for groupthink overriding more prudent and informed debate about you know, the uh, the right balance of deterrence and reassurance, um, competition and cooperation that's required uh, to manage stable relations between the world's two largest powers. Um, so one of the things that concerns me is this uh, line of argument that, that the U.S. needs to kind of play to win needs to somehow uh, defeat China in a new Cold War. And uh, there's, a, there's a game theoretical concept of the infinite game that I think gives us a, a better way of thinking about this, right? So China isn't going to disappear if it is uh, defeated in a new Cold War, that would mean a new government would come to power in China, not that China would cease to exist as a state, or even if the Chinese state were to collapse into 50 states, there would still be some Chinese states that would have relations with its with their neighbors and with the United States. So no, there's no scenario where the United States won't have to deal with some version of China 
moving forward. And, you know, I think better evidence is that China will maintain a unified state and that it will remain a powerful country in the world with a large population, even if its population starts to shrink and its economy declines, it will remain extremely influential in international politics. So there's no version of a prudent US strategy that should aim for sustained uh, animosity with China that doesn't also undermine US uh, security and uh, I would say general welfare, right? The, the ability of American consumers to have affordable groceries and uh, goods. So the US and China are really in a symbiotic relationship, whether we like it or not. I think that the concept of de-risking is the right way to frame a, a prudent approach to kind of economic competition with China. And I think that that has uh, come uh, to the fore in, in debates in DC that, that there is not really a world where the United States can decouple, can separate its economy from the Chinese economy completely. Um, the goal would be, or a more realistic goal would be to reduce the reliance of American critical industries on Chinese components or on Chinese manufacturing capacity. That's what they mean by de-risking is essentially reducing the degree to which China could credibly threaten to undermine U.S. productive capacity or uh, undermine the U.S. economy through economic sanctions uh, so that we don't have as much exposure to potential coercion by the PRC. That's de-risking. Uh, decoupling is a really uh, fantastical notion that the U.S., can become more autarkic or can establish a new economic block that would take care of all of America's economic uh, trade trade needs. Um, and that's just simply not how the global economy is structured these days. Yeah, although it doesn't stop some people from calling for it, does it? Um, no, that's right. So uh, to get back into some um, sort of technical uh, questions um, about your field. Can you explain military operations other than war? And is the acronym pronounced MUTWA? Um, and <laughs> yes, you know, it's in your book, of course, and yeah. it's an American word, I believe, but uh, you wrote about the importance of the concept to Chinese mi military strategy. Yeah, no, it's a, that's uh, an excellent topic. So, um, so Actually, one of the chapters that I co-authored in the U.S. study, Military Coercion and U.S. Foreign Policy, was focused on this concept of military operations other than war. This was an a element of U.S. military doctrine um, between 1994 and 2006, or roughly in there, maybe 95 to 96, or uh, to 2006. Um, and what it did was it provided a framework for understanding and explaining the different roles that the U.S. military has in peacetime, right? And the kinds of operations that the U.S. military is engaged in on a persistent basis to try to shape the international security environment and to try to support different political and diplomatic objectives. So this means, uh, in practice, working alongside partner forces in joint military exercises or conducting joint training um, it means conducting peacekeeping operations or counterterrorism operations, uh, providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, evacuating noncombatants from a war zone, etc. Uh, and in all of these different kinds of uh, operations, which are not necessarily war uh, or in a context of armed conflict, they are all intended to serve as a means of advancing security objectives. Right? And, and sort of deepening America's practical cooperation and uh, influence with other countries. Uh, it's, it's one of the ways by which 
the U.S. military attempts to contribute to America's global leadership role um, and to kind of demonstrate practical benefits of partnering with the United States. So some of these operations that as I just listed a, a few of the varieties of uh, military operations other than war. Um, some of them involve the use of force, but others do not. And some of them are clearly not coercive, uh, but others can be, depending on how they're used. So um, the U.S. eventually abandoned that concept in favor of refocusing on stability operations. But at the same time as the U.S. was kind of parting ways with Mukwa as a, as a uh, doctrinal framework, uh, the People's Liberation Army was embracing those, those same concepts. Um, because, in part, it was looking for ways to explain its roles in peacetime. It, it's a, uh, you know, you'll often hear armed forces describe their role as fighting and winning the nation's wars, right? And indeed, that is that is something that uh, both militaries are preparing to do, um, are responsible for. But we're not in a war. Uh, and so... The PLA was seeking a way of explaining and providing kind of a legal basis, actually, for its roles and missions during peacetime. And, um, you know, so it is China has also drastically increased the uh, number of troops that it provides to international peacekeeping operations. Uh, it conducts international uh, joint military exercises, and it also engages in what are uh, uh, included under stability operations and U.S. Per, uh, purposes, but you know things like uh, maritime law enforcement patrols and that sort of thing, uh, or counter piracy operations. Uh, now, China has also engaged in international uh, counter piracy operations, but it can also chase uh, people around the South China Sea in uh, pursuit of those same kind of missions. Um, so what it's trying to do is use, uh, in the Chinese context, it's usually translated as non-war military operations um, as a way of kind of campaigning for certain political objectives over time, like enforcing Chinese jurisdiction in the South China Sea, uh, or enforcing its sovereignty claims, or creating laws that uh, make it a crime uh, to to support separatism in Taiwan, for instance. Uh, and so it's a, a way of kind of securitizing legal issues and justifying a role for the armed forces outside the context of a, a major conflict. Right, that makes sense. Um, now, on a slightly different concept, gray zone deterrence, which... Um, uh, correct me if my understanding is wrong, but I, I think of like the use of the Coast Guard to intimidate, you know, Philippine, uh, Filipino fishing vessels. Um, they, China makes quite a lot of use of gray zone deterrence, but it's never mentioned uh, in official Chinese uh, communications, uh, you, you, you write in your book. Is that just because they hope to be able to plausibly deny that China is the aggressor in any conflicts that get publicized in the media? Or what, what's behind the you know, frequent use of this, uh, of this type of deterrence, but never speaking about it? Yeah, I, I think it's... it's uh more straightforwardly satisfied with the concept of deterrence, that what it's doing is enforcing its rules and deterring bad behavior. Um, so, you know, China's uh, concept of deterrence uh, or th their concept is weisha in, in Mandarin uh, is usually translated as deterrence, but I think actually it's it's much more akin to the, the way that I described the, the word coercion, right? That it's both deterrence and compellence, depending on what goals are being pursued uh, in, in specific instances. So um, I think in the cases that you were just pointing to, it's important to think about uh, the fact that China views its use of armed coercion as primarily defensive. 
that it's reacting to some perceived violation of, of, of a clear deterrent demand, or it's making sure that its rights are respected. So it doesn't view its own actions as challenges to world order the way that, that uh, many uh, tend to in the United States uh, and the West. Uh, it views them as essentially upholding order or upholding its rights uh, and defending its interests. And so in that sense, um, you know, the term gray zone uh, is, a, is a relatively contested term. Some think that it is useless because it describes too much and too little or too little. Um, but in brief, it's any effort in, uh, in excess of kind of normal competitive behavior like business, com uh, business competition um, to uh, coerce or, or revise the status quo or gain advantage um, in such a way that you're seeking to avoid escalation to armed conflict. So it's an effort to engage in kind of revisionist behavior um, or what would be unacceptable behavior, but short of actions that would provoke a more forceful response. Let's say, for example, in the Philippines, China is attempting to push its agenda as hard as it can without triggering a uh, mutual defense response from the United States and the Philippines. So gray zone deterrence is an effort to intimidate, but without pushing things up the escalation ladder, if possible. And uh, so it responds forcefully when its sovereignty claims are challenged, and it responds uh, by escalating when the other side escalates. But when it's confronted by a larger power like the United States, China tends to kind of back off and, and, and wait and see what the next uh, move will be. And uh, so I, I would describe their kind of uh, main strategy as a as a strategy of uh, patience and persistence that they are applying low level pressure over time in a way that's designed to avoid direct contest uh, or resolution of the issue uh, by force of arms, but that will gradually erode kind of the the resistance or the will to to resist. Right, right. Okay, we have a, a question uh, from an audience member. Uh, Tim Douglas asks, it seems like these potential conflicts with China are all based on territorial disputes. China feels as though portions of its border with India are Chinese territory. China feels as though Taiwan is part of China itself. China feels as though its disputes with the Philippines relate to islands that are theirs or that certain borders imply navigational territory. It doesn't seem like these potential conflicts can ever be resolved until the Chinese and these other countries can agree on borders or, or the status of certain territories. Do you agree? And if so, how would you advise these disputes be resolved? So that's a million yeah, dollar question right there. That is, that is a million dollar question. Um, there is an alternative approach, which is to leave territorial disputes unresolved to sort of mutually accept the status quo on the ground that you know islands that are under the effective control and administration of Vietnam remain so islands that are under the effective control and administration of the PRC remain so etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but to come up with better cooperative arrangements for managing the kind of economic resources the one the one sense in which I would um, push back on the premise of the question uh, or just kind of clarify, not all of the disputes are territorial disputes, but many of them relate to underlying territorial disputes. But many of the disputes are really about, you know, Vietnam's goal of improving its own energy security by identifying oil and gas reserves off its coast within its economic, within its exclusive economic zone or the Philippines' right to fish in its archipelago, right? 
Um, so there are economic rights and practices that kind of trigger the friction related to underlying territorial disputes. They disagree over who has jurisdiction or who has the, the right to exploit those economic resources. Um, back in, I believe it was 2014, um, but don't, don't quote me on that, uh, China and Japan actually established a kind of mutual uh, economic zone between them. They can't agree on kind of where a neutral uh, maritime boundary is, but they agreed that they would mutually develop economic resources in a particular geography. Now that uh, agreement was only partially implemented and I think both sides have complained about violations on the other side, but I think it also provides a potential model that could be built upon for uh, mutually development or mutually beneficial development goals being achieved by all of the parties to, to these disputes. Um, if the resources are managed in a in a kind of consultative way, in a collective way, and I, you know, I suspect a big part of the ongoing negotiations for a binding code of conduct in the South China Sea have to do with clarifying these kind of rules of the road for inherently contested. Uh, geographic spaces that have economic resources that all sides want to benefit from. So, yes, I, I think that resolving the territorial disputes might be ideal, but it also might be more likely to lead to uh, unnecessary conflict if there were diplomatic negotiations over how to manage those resources in a in a mutually beneficial way, that would probably be preferable to war. All right, that makes sense. Um, we've got about three minutes um, left. Um, so uh, I just want to ask you a quick question about the mindset of the Chinese leadership. Uh, uh, China's got 14 neighbors with land borders, five, five South China Sea neighbors, if you include Taiwan as a country, which of course China doesn't. And then there are uh, South Korea and Japan. Uh, whereas, um, and American military bases dotted all over the place. Whereas here in the United States, we have two friendly neighbors and you know beautiful, huge, shining oceans on either side of us. Um, how, how much of the strategies in your book are driven by the neighborhood that China is in? And I've got to ask you to answer that in about two minutes. Sure. Um, I think that the United States plays an outsized role in the, the mind of, of China's leaders um, in terms of its perception about its security environment and the threats that it faces. Um, so I don't think that its neighbors are as large of a concern as the United States and the US alliance network that kind of makes a neat little ring uh, along China's maritime coast. Um, one of the consistent elements in Chinese military thinking is its inferiority or perceived disadvantage relative to the United States. And a lot of the military strategies that China has uh, developed are really rooted in that inferiority or that sense of, of uh, disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. The U.S. conducts surveillance missions along China's coastline in the air and in the sea uh, regularly, and that makes China somewhat uncomfortable. And I think a lot of what we've seen China doing uh, in terms of improving its military capabilities and posture in the South China Sea is intended to make the United States less comfortable operating in those geographies, uh, just from a um, perception of risk standpoint. So um, I do think it has to do with China's geographical challenges and geopolitical challenges. But um, in terms of its military, its threat of military, its um, perception of military threats, I think the United States is the principal 
actor that it's focused on and um, everything else is a distant second. Well, thank you very much, James. It was very informative. I'll hand it over to Leonie, whose fire drill appears to have ended. Good afternoon to everyone. Sorry about what happened before. And thank you, Jeremy, for taking care of. Uh, thank you both, uh, James and Jeremy, for this fantastic conversation. So important for us to understand global affairs and how it impacts uh, the US. Um, I would like to announce that all events uh, for this semester are posted on our website, TN wac.org. We will have two events coming up in September and at the beginning of October. September 24th at 12 uh, p.m. Central Time, Honorable Carl Dean will interview Matthew Hughes, uh, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of America, our mother organization. On October 2nd, the Council will host the President and CEO of the Metro Metropolitan Nashville Airport Authority, Douglas Crowley, for a lunch at Best Berry and Sims. So we welcome everyone uh, to come. The program will be archived, available on tnwac.org soon. Consider becoming a member and a donor supporting us uh, to carry out our mission through all events and projects on global affairs. Once more, thank you, Jeremy and James, and uh, thank you all and goodbye for now. <laughs>